Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. This is a very special video edition of Suspense Radio. We are here with three fantastic authors. We are here with Christine Feehan, Cheryl Wilson, and Sheila English. Good morning, guys. How are you doing? Good, Good morning. morning. Good. This is a panel that I like to call Writing with Friends because uh, Christine and I had an interview not too long ago about one of her books, and we kind of talked about off the air how many different authors don't really understand the process of writing, what it's like to actually write a book, what it, it details. I mean, a lot of people are like, well, why can't you just write 12 books a year? I mean, how difficult can it be to write a book? I mean, come on. Um, and you just kind of laugh at those people because you know they really don't understand what it's like to kind of get a book going and how a book kind of gets going. So before we kind of start, what I'm going to do is, is like, this is going to be a moderation panel. Like if we're sitting at a BoucherCon or a Thriller Fest or any of these conferences. So I'm going to give you guys a little chance to introduce yourself. Uh, we'll just go right down the line in my video order. So Christine, give everybody a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm Christine Fian. Uh, I have written over 90 books, uh, published over 90 books at this point. Uh, I have 16 books that are uh, on the number one, have a hit number one, New York Times, and uh, quite a few others, most of them have been on the New, New York Times. So I've been very blessed to have my readers support me. And um, I mostly write uh, in the paranormal realm, but I write uh always there's romance in my books, but I write thrillers and suspense and all kinds of different types of books. And um, really enjoy, I really enjoy writing, obviously, or I wouldn't have that many books. And see everybody after 90 books, you see you have wrist issues because you write so much. That's what happens people. <laughs> That's true. See, when you just, see, look at that. That's called editing. So, okay. <laughs> okay. And um, so CL, Tell yes. us a little about yourself. Hi, I'm Cheryl Wilson. I write as CL Wilson. Um, I have have not published 90 books, but I have published <laughs> seven uh, epic fantasy uh, romance novels and a few short fiction pieces, also paranormal or, or fantasy. Um, like Christine, all of my books have a romance in them. Um, I have been, I have a degree in creative writing. That was my, my college major. And I've studied a lot of uh, writing through um, genre fiction organizations like uh, Romance Writers America. So I spent a long time studying the craft of writing and um, learning how to plot the books. I started a million books and, and had to learn how to finish them. So that was my journey to publishing. Um, five of my books have been on bestseller list, New York Times, USA Today, and Publishers Weekly. And um, I've slowed down the last few years, spending more time with, uh, with my family, but I'm trying to get back into publishing now. I don't think I'll ever reach 90 books a year, but that'll be my goal now, Chris. <laughs> Fabulous. So Sheila, what you got for us? Well, um, I ha have also not written 90 books and I'm just so excited to be uh, here with Cheryl and Christine, who are my dear friends. Mm -hmm. And um, I write, uh, I like to call it modern Gothic, and uh, I do write some historical Gothic. I write the Adam Frankenstein series which was uh, a best of from Suspense Magazine mm -hmm. back in 2016. Yes, so sir. that was yes, exciting. Was. Uh, I also write comic books. So my Adam Frankenstein uh, also has comic books and that has won several awards as well. So I primarily have been writing in the genre, in the horror genre. Uh, but more gothic. So it's kind of a horror and romance together. So um, I've been writing for years and I have been in the industry for years. So I have uh, also worked with publishers and know uh, quite a bit about, you know, what, what they're picking up and what they're looking at and, and that kind of thing as well, which is handy when you're a writer. 
So, <clears throat> but um, yeah, I've I've won several several awards for my different Adam Frankenstein books, and I'm currently shopping around a full length novel. Nice. Well, yeah. it's great to have the three of you here. Uh, I know that people are going to be very excited to kind of hear what you guys have to say. So let's kind of go into it uh, uh, and start right now. One of the biggest things and one of the biggest questions that I get and a lot of people always kind of ask is, hey, I want to write about what's going on today. So they kind of want to try to follow the trend of the books that are being published today. And I always say, if you follow a trend, you're probably already behind it because the trend is already gone. Because what a lot of people don't realize in the publishing world is like with all of you, when you write a book and you send it in, you're talking by the time that you finish that novel the first time to send it into your publisher, it's a good nine to 12 months before we'll ever see the light of day. So a lot of those books are already in the system and going and the new trends are already not even being published just because they're being edited. So how would you answer the question to people when they say, how important is it to follow the trends that are going on in writing today? Um, I, pick it up as you want to. I, I absolutely say, uh, don't, don't even look at that because I'm with you. You definitely are gonna be behind that trend. Mm -hmm. You wanna be the trendsetter. You right. want to be that person who follows your heart and write the book you're passionate about. You, you absolutely need to be the front runner. So if you, if you are trying to follow somebody else's lead, you're not, you're not going to be passionate about that book. You have to be the one that, I mean, if you look at something and it can be in that genre, but you still have to write the book that you're most passionate about. You, you can't just look at a trend and go, oh, this is gonna be going on forever because they don't last forever. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Cheryl, what do you think? <laughs> I, I think the same thing. And since it takes me years to write a single book, <laughs> following trends is, is like saying, I'm gonna write a book for dinosaurs and um, <laughs> oops. So uh, yeah, I was writing epic fantasy when vampires, my very best friend was writing, was becoming the queen of paranormal romance, uh -huh. writing vampire novels. And um, it's hard when you have a book that you love, that you feel so strongly about that in my, New York was the <clears throat> self-publishing was only starting. Right. Um, I actually considered self-publishing, but I really wanted to be published by New York. And it's hard when you have a book that you love um, that nobody wants to read because that's not what they're buying right now. Um, but I will say thank you, Peter Jackson, for the Lord of the Rings um, movies. And <laughs> uh, eventually, you know, a good book will catch the eye of the right editor. And, um, and that's what you want. You want an editor who's as passionate about your book as you are, because they're your advocate in the, um, in the publishing house. And um, you want them to be your evangelist. You want them to be out there saying how great your, your book is, even if it bucks trends. Um, so I definitely think uh, some people, I think if they write super fast, may be able to write something and catch it in a trend, but it better be a long lasting trend because it does take, in New York, in, in traditional print publishing, it will take uh, nine months to a year or possibly longer right. mm -hmm. to get published. Um, Self-publishing gives you a quicker window, um, but you can't be a, a, a slow writer and follow trends. I think that's that, that means you're doomed to hold that manuscript under your bed until the trend comes back around. Sheila. Well, I, I agree. I don't think that uh, following the trend is the way to go. You know, Christine mentioned, uh, you know, you want to you want to write a book that you can be passionate about, not, you know, it makes it kind of business if you're following a trend and you know you have to do these things then it, it does become just business as, a, as, a, as opposed to being some fun, creative journey that you're on that you can be passionate about. 
And so I, I definitely agree, you know, you want to be the trendsetter. Um, you know, it's nice when you, when you have an agent or you, you have somebody in the industry who might be able to tell you, you know, okay, you know, I, we are, you know, picking up, we will continue to pick up this kind of trend in the next couple of years, or they're going to say, you know, the market is saturated with this. And that's what happens right. when you have a trend, people who do write fast, like Cheryl was saying, trying to catch the tail of it and they saturate the market. And, and then you find that readers, you know, start to have fatigue of that particular theme or, or genre, well, maybe not a genre, but definitely a, a, a trendy theme. But, um, but yeah, I, I also think that following a trend isn't the way to go. Mm -hmm. Now, for a lot of new authors that are sitting there and, they, and they're trying to get their first book done, and, I, and you all probably have those books that are shoved in a, in a drawer somewhere that you wrote way back when that are never going to see the light of day. Uh, and maybe you might pull them out and say, wow, what was I thinking? But there's a lot of new authors that are struggling with that first story. And a lot of it always comes down to character versus story. What do they kind of work off of? Do they, do they hit the characters hard or do they function with the story? Or how does that kind of work? And, you know, how do they get that balance, especially for their first novel? Because that's the one that, you know, if, if it's never seen and never written, and if they don't want to self-publish, then they're never going to write again. So, Christine, we'll go back to you. So when you see a new author and, and they're kind of asking you your, your points and maybe character versus story comes up, what do you kind of tell them that they need to really focus on um, with their stories in relation to character versus story? Which, which do you think is the most, most important weighted part that, that a new author should kind of focus on? For me, for any reader, because I'm a reader first, obviously, um, when you're reading a story, if you aren't involved with your characters, you're not going to continue reading that story. You have to love the characters to keep going. You, you do. And, a, and characters drive a story. They are going to tell your writer which direction that story is going. You can have the most wonderful story in the world, but if, you, if your readers hate the characters or the characters are just blah, people aren't going to continue reading and they're never going to get past that. You have to have great characters to, to keep that story going because how are you going to get the people involved in your story? So as far as I'm concerned, it, it's your characters that, that absolutely you have to concentrate on because that's how you're going to get that great story to unfold. That's way I feel about it. Cheryl, what do you think? Cheryl? Um, I agree. And especially, I mean, obviously in romance, it's really all about the characters because it's a book about emotions. I think there are books where the story, Jaws comes to mind, is it's the shark. It's the fear that's the central uh, reason you keep turning the pages. In Amityville Horror, it was the house. It was the oh, horror. That so, book scared the hell out of me. And I read that thing when I think when I was 10 years old, I, I did too. I, well, I saw the movie when I was nine. My, my sister dragged me to that movie, scared the bejesus out of me. And then I was dumb enough to read the book thinking, oh, well, it's not going to be as bad. Oh, yeah, it was. It but, was. But Cheryl, I, it, but Cheryl, I beg to differ with you. The shark was the character. Yes. And the house was the character. Yes, I agree. But I think that's what, I think I said that. That was the the well the they were also the story but they're right. not the they were the character it was the horror the fear that feeling i think is really what and the mystery what's going to happen um but the humans in either of those books um and that's not to ding right because i read them and i love them and clearly they did very well for the authors of those books. So I'm not saying their characters weren't good or anything. I want to be clear about sure. that. But the focus of the book wasn't the people, which is what we refer to as characters. It was um, this other entity in the story. Mm -hmm. um, so you're right. It is th that those became the character. Um, if you're saying that's what you were really, you know, the feeling of reading it, 
was why you were reading it. So, right. but most stories people read because it's the way the character, it, the character arc is the change in the character and the story is what propels the character to change. So from a structure of a novel perspective, that's why character is important because you, you have to build sympathy for this person, why they're on this journey, you, and, and that the journey um, is sufficiently challenging uh, to uh, events real change in that character. So the person at the end of the book is not the same as the person of, at the beginning of the book. Um, I would say in Amityville Horror, I'm not sure that the family changed so much. The situation changed a little, but then they ran. They decided to pack up and leave the house, which they should have done in chapter two. In day one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if a house so, tells me to get out, I'm going to listen to the house. I'm so, sorry. <laughs> so I would suggest for most. Um, authors always focus on the character because that's, you know, we're people, we connect with other people. So that's where your focus should really be. But you can write a book where something who's not a person could be the driving force behind the book. That's the reason people keep turning the pages. Right. Sheila? Well, you know, one thing that I, I, I agree um, that it's character, absolutely 100%. Uh, but I do want to just point out you don't have to love the character for the character to be compelling and engaging. I, you know, I think of Joker, the movie, you know, I would not say that I love, I think that was a, a lovable character or you think of Gone Girl and I don't want to give any spoilers, but. Um, if people haven't read Gone Girl by now, that's their own fault. <laughs> all right. So, I mean, was there anybody to love in Gone Girl? I don't think so. Right. You know what I mean? It's like, you don't have to have this lovable character that everybody falls in love with. So you want to see them have a happy ending. You know, for romance, you need a happy ending, but not, not all genres uh, right. are romance. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to just kind of clarify is that it, it is character. Mm -hmm no matter if you love them or you hate them, if they're crazy and doing crazy things, you want to know what in the world could this person possibly do next? So no, no matter to me, no matter how you look at it and it, and it could be the house, it could, you're, you're still thinking, what the heck is this house going to do next? It's always going to be character hundred percent. Okay. Now, Cheryl, you brought up something interesting and I'm going to go back to that because you're right, they weren't humans, but, the, but now a big thing is the setting and all three of you have to do something that a lot, some, a lot of authors, you know, that are famous, let's just say, you know, like a Lee Child or somebody like that, their settings are already done because they're writing about cities that are already there and they're not having to do anything, but you have to world build. Yes. So, because when you're in paranormal, you're talking about things that don't exist in normal society that you don't see that are not there. So you have to use your setting as another character, whether it's secondary or whether you have to make it as the main focus part of your story. So talk then a little bit about world building like you had to do in the Jaws or in an Amityville Horror, because those are two different settings that are not ordinary, walking down the street, having a serial killer or chasing a bad guy if it's police procedural or something like that. So Christine, I'll start with you. Talk about how you have to world build something that's not there and make it there and then make it relevant to your story in a setting. Well, for me, that's actually the fun part because that's building on the imagination. Mm -hmm. So you, for me, I can clearly see it in my head, almost like a, a movie and I can, um, build the map in my head and then on paper, I can put it all on paper and draw it all out. <clears throat> I don't go as far as my good friend, Cheryl, who <laughs> literally will get uh, rulers and she, she really does it. <laughs> I'm not as good as her. Uh, although my son will, um, if, if there's a fight scene, we actually will, will do that with helicopters and, you know, oh. we, we, we do that kind of thing, 
But um, as far as my worlds go, I definitely have to know where everything is in, in the world and um, the rules of the world and how they're going to um, interact within that world. You, you have to know your, your rules from the very beginning of it. And then um, because you don't wanna break those rules. So even if I don't reveal all of them from the very beginning um, to my readers, I have to know them and I have to know what's going to happen. So all of that has to be set up before I even begin. Um, gotcha. Yeah. And so oftentimes if I have a place, a setting, um, I have to build that all. Um, I don't physically uh, do it, but I do do it on paper. So I know where everything is. And uh, I do have a son, my son, who also is a writer. He was supposed to be here today, but San Francisco to the airport. Oh, you know, yeah. That's a phone. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he is really good at, at maps and, and he draws things out for me. So uh, the two of us sit and go over that. He's, he's really, really good with that. That's very, yeah, that, that's very intense. Cause again, cause you're, you're not just writing about New York city or Los Angeles. Like you have to write about something that's not there. Right. And, you know, and so, yeah. And so Cheryl, when you're having to write about something like, like that's not there and make it believable, how, I mean, how would you tell an author, you know, this is like the challenge. This is something that's important, especially in paranormal and romance and, and again, in those kinds of genres. And fantasy, fantasy, yeah, fantasy. And science fiction. Um, and, and I will say Christine also does something and, and the setting's important for mood and tone in a story. And she does an excellent job with choosing settings and using descriptive words mm -hmm. that really set emotional tone in every scene. So that's another way that, that obviously setting impacts your story. And um, I give a world building workshop. I like to teach writing as well as, as do it myself. Um, and uh, some of the best advice that I um, ever got when I was researching um, world building and, and compiling my own workshop came from a sci-fi fantasy author named S. Andrew Swan, who says, um, figure out what's unique about your world and make that uniqueness integral to the plot of your story. So if we were talking about Amityville Horror, the uniqueness in that world is the house. It is entirely integral mm. to that story. You can look at Dune and in Spice is the thing right. that's unique about that world, utterly integral to the story. If you don't have Spice, you don't have a story. Um, the Force in Star Wars. So you, there's all sorts of, of examples I can give you of people who do that. Um, for me, I, I do extensive world building. I do maps. I do maps drawn to scale. And she's what she's talking about is I use dental floss and I measure the, the route of my little people and figure out how. Did you say oh, dental floss? Dental floss, because it curbs. So it's <laughs> easy to, to take your little map and draw your little path. And then you straighten it out, measure it, and you know. This and then after lunch, you got, it, you, you got something to work it's with. Minty Fresh, yeah. my See, maps are Minty go. Fresh. <laughs> yes. But um, I, I do that because uh, for consistency's sake. So because suspension of disbelief is imperative anytime you write fiction, but especially when you're writing speculative fiction, fantasy, sci-fi, paranormal. Um, you're obviously writing about things that aren't real. So you have to make people at least be willing to jump in and believe that they're real and you need to keep them there because the minute you pull them out of your story, you've lost them. And that gives people an excuse to put your book down, which is the last thing you want. So, I mean, I, I did all of that. I, I, you still have to do research because you still have to figure out what's a reasonable like rate of travel or what have you. But I created languages. I did, you know, all of that. I created races, cultures, you know, the yeah. best question for uh, if you're world building, and actually it's the best question, I think, for 
for any book is what do either your character or your culture, whatever value, and what are they doing? What are they willing to do to defend it or to protect it or what have you? Um, because if you can get, if you can dil distill something down to what people value and what they're willing to do to protect it, you, you can get to all sorts of really interesting stories and yeah. places in your story. So, um, but the key is, and I do lots of maps. Um, I do maps of houses too. So I don't forget, you know, where the kitchens and bedrooms are. Um, maps of cities so you remember where your buildings are so you're not turning left in chapter one and turning right in chapter two um, so that's all just to make your made up world feel as real as possible to the reader to suck them in and hold them there as your characters go through their journey sheila what you got well, you know, a couple of things, just um, both Cheryl and Christine are fantastic at world building. Um, mine is kind of a hybrid. So I am dealing with established characters. One of my characters is Mary Shelley. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have read eight or nine books on Mary Shelley's life, her real life, so that I can understand her voice and uh, where she was coming from and what she was going through. And maybe one or two percent of that will ever make it in the book, right? But uh, but because I'm dealing with a real person, and a lot of people know who that person is, I try to stay as true to her in as many ways as I can. So for those people who are doing a hybrid world building, I do recommend that you know if you're going to talk about you know Oscar Wilde is one of your characters, then you better know something about Oscar Wilde so that people who do know that character realize, you know, or, or they can think, oh, this might be something that he would have said, or this might be something that he would have done. Um, and so you have to be really careful with that. So for my hybrid world, you know, that lives with uh, like with Frankenstein, um, you know, imagining reading everything about you, everything you can about Frankenstein, and then you get to kind of imagine where he would have gone if he had lived and you know in my world he's a u.s marshal so you know what kind of u.s marshal would frankenstein be i don't know uh, one of the things that i believe uh both christine and cheryl do and i also do this that i think is just practical when you're world building whether it's for one book or for a series of books but especially for a series of books is we create uh for lack of a better word i'll call it a bible and, um, you know, if, if you're going to have a lot of places, a lot of people, it's, you, you know that this is going to go into a series. From book one, you need to keep track of the names and what they did. If there was something special about them. Where did they come from? Anything you might revisit. If they were shot, where were they shot at? Were they shot in the left leg or the right leg? Those things are, they're, they're all really important. And, you know, I, I have a list. I'll even take pictures of people. Like I'll find some, something online. Nobody else is going to see it. You know, it's just for you. I'll, I'll find the picture of what I think my character looks like. And I'll, I'll put that in my little Bible and with, along with their description. And I'll do that for all the characters that I know I'm going to revisit, that I'm going to go back to. And the same goes for, uh, you know, I have a, a large mansion that is on a very teeny tiny island that's uh, a few hours from London. And it's like, okay, I need to know something about that island, you know, so that I know what kind of vegetation there is. So I'll write a little something about the island and I'll write uh, what, that, what that, the mansion looks like and that kind of thing. So I do recommend for people who are doing some serious world building that you start at the beginning because you don't want to get five books in and then start start creating right. that because that's just a nightmare. So that would, if, if there was one takeaway, I would say when it comes to world building, keep track of it. There's one other thing I would like to add, which is yeah. keeping an, an idea file because I search the web for interest, pictures of interesting places that are beautiful or 
if there's something about them that's like the crystal caves in Mexico, the big crystal where the quartz crystals are the size of you know giraffes underground or the pink lakes and the pink lake i think in australia i can't I, I can't remember where it is but these absolutely gorgeous places or really fascinating looking places and all of that goes into an idea file along with interesting looking people and those are things i refer to when i'm world building or writing a new book sorry sorry to interrupt sheila no that's uh... And, and, you know, the one thing that you mentioned, you, you said Star Wars and you said the force and I study Buddhism. And the one thing that you notice about Star Wars and the force is that that's Buddhism. Yes, like that's Buddhism almost in its core. When they die, they become enlightened. And, you know, the force is everything that surrounds you. And, it, and it's always like that. And if you look at those things, but there are some plot holes in some very, very big books. And, and I'm going to and I want to talk about plot holes because it's something that never talks about. And in one of the biggest series ever written in the world, Harry Potter, there's massive plot holes that go on throughout that series. And I'll talk about book three, for instance. You have a device that can time travel and you give it to a student to not be late for class. And the reader's just supposed to gloss that over and thinking that the story, like, wait a second, you have a device the most powerful device that you could ever make or write in anything time travel. And you use it to give to a student not to be late to class. And it just so happened that that device then was used later for something else, but it wasn't supposed to be used in that manner. So uh, let's start with you. And let's, let's start with you, Cheryl, because you write fantasy. And so you could have these kinds of things that could come up. Do you worry about when you see those plot holes or that suspension of disbelief and things like that? Because it doesn't seem that the reader cares about it. Because also in that book, there was the Marauder's Map. And the Marauder's Map, you know, he's looking at it. So you mean to tell me that Ron's brothers never once was wondering, why is this Peter Pettigrew guy following my, my brother around everywhere? And we don't even know who he is. But again, that was never talked about. So talk a little bit about things like that, because it's nothing that she gets dinged for but there's some massive plot holes within that story, but no one seems to really care. Why do you think that is? Uh, in that case, I would say because the overwhelming feeling of that story was it's so delightful and you know, you just like the world so much you're willing to give them a pass. Same okay. thing with the um, uh, remake of Star, reboot of Star Wars with the little brown, brown fluid that started uh, black holes that magically disappeared after sucking Vul Vulcan up. Um, and, and people do still ding them, they give them crap, but overall people don't care. I mean, uh, the majority of people don't care. They're willing to say, okay, I'll give you a pass on that because the rest is so entertaining. Right. This is what critique partners are for, because I can tell you, you, get, you can get tunnel vision when you're writing and you don't even see it because you're thinking, this way i usually worry it to death and then i try to put explanations in why it doesn't do this why it, and try and stick it in the book but you know you don't want to go down the list while you're writing your book and it can't do this because this and it can't do this because this the little time turner thing she could easily have said it only lets you go back um three days mm -hmm. because why else would you not go back and take voldemort out before he did everything right yeah so, uh, yeah, that's why time travel novels usually have- Not only that, it was never explained how Dumbledore even got that thing. Yes. Like, it was <laughs> never explained, like, how he came apart, you know, the most powerful artifact you could ever have in a book. Well, he also had the Elder Wand, which supposedly is one of the most powerful- Right, art, right? but that couldn't take him back in time. Yes. So, yeah, I would have put some things in there, but sometimes people are going- uh, readers are willing to give a pass on the majority of readers other ones it will really bother them and they you know i remain to this day really bothered by um terminator 2 because two blue-eyed people gave birth to a brown-eyed boy and i'm like that is not uh that is the postman's child that is not the soldier from the, <laughs> the <UPS guy. laughs> so uh but did i still enjoy the movie yeah. Right. 
even though it was about the postman's job. So, so I think it depends on how compelling the rest of your book is, but don't, I mean, you should have critique partners and, and beta readers look over stuff because different eyes look at books different ways and may find something you miss because when you're in the weeds, you don't always see the plot holes. Sheila, follow up with that critique groups. That's very good. Um, so new authors should, should how many, should you get involved in one good critique group? Should you be maybe involved in a couple different ones? If you plan on writing different genres, like if you wanna write paranormal romance or you wanna write horror or you wanna write thriller, should you find critique groups that are specific to those genres? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, first I, I do wanna follow up a little bit on, um, on, on what Cheryl was saying. Uh, I think that's an exa a perfect example of character over story. Uh, when there's a when there's a plot problem and people just kind of gloss over it, it's because your characters were amazing. I think of Doctor Who. There are so many problems with, <laughs> with everything. Doctor Who and time tra <laughs> oh, it's insane. And you know what? I go to the Doctor Who convention every time I get the chance, and I'm with my tribe, and we all love the Doctor, and we all laugh about the crazy stuff that was not correct. But we all get together and we all love the Doctor, and and that's. That, that right there is an example of how important character is, mm -hmm. you know, o over story. Uh, but uh, as far as critique partners go and, and beta readers, I, I also have both. Should you have a critique partner or group that is just within your genre? Uh, you know, it helps because they understand kind of the rules of your genre. Mm -hmm. but it's also nice to have somebody who doesn't read your genre who might not understand because you get a completely different perspective uh, because of what I write, which is both horror and romance. It's, it's good to have, you know, there are some people who will not read horror. I won't mention any names, Christine. And, um, <laughs> and it's funny because horror and romance can kind of go together. They can. <laughs> that's, what, that's what gothic is for sure. You know. you know, but but then you know, I definitely want people who understand relationships mm -hmm. because I do have romance. Um, you know, you're talking about um, you know, setting scenes and such. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got in my entire writing career was from Christine Feehan. And it changed everything for me. It's, it's going to sound so simple, but it was so huge. And, and that was that atmosphere is important. Atmosphere is a part uh. of the story. Atmosphere is a character. Some of the best advice I ever got. So, and you can see, you want to have, you know, you want to have those kind of writing partners, critique partners, that that have that kind of wisdom and can share that with you and they understand what's happening with your writing they can look at it and say this is good but this this is kind of missing and you want to have that and whether that comes from a romance writer or a suspense writer or a fantasy writer it it, it doesn't it doesn't really matter as long as you have somebody who cares about how your story is going, coming along and how you're doing. You want people who are invested in you as a writer and are, are willing to read your stuff, stuff and hopefully love it because they love you or just love it because it's great and they give you good advice. Christine? I agree, with, I agree with Sheila. Our group has um, <clears throat> romantic suspense, I mean, serial killers. Mm -hmm. and um, fantasy and gothic horror. And I mean, we're all different. None of us really write the same thing, but we're all invested in each other's work. We want each other to succeed. And that's the key to what you're looking for is um, people who want you to succeed and you want them to succeed. So you want people who really uh, care about your writing. And um, I am lucky enough to have someone, uh, another person who isn't necessarily with our group, but when she reads my work, uh, because I write, I do write fast. And my first draft 
is so bad. <laughs> because I never go backwards. I, right. You just I, keep going I, I get, and then you'll fix it later. Right. Exactly. So I might get to chapter six and go, oh, I need to put this thread in. And so from chapter six forward, that threads in, but it doesn't, it, it's not right, in yeah. chapter one. So when she reads it, she's the one who says, oh, this isn't going to work because this, you know, this character would never do this. Right. Or, I mean, she's the one who sees the plot holes because I'm writing, I'm writing really fast and she catches all those plot holes for me. I, I mean, she sees them. She's got right. those eyes that absolutely can see them. And you have to be willing, you have to trust somebody. You have to have someone that you feel you can trust that is going to say, um, you, you surround yourself with those people that you do trust. Mm -hmm. Like when Cheryl says something to me, I, I listen to her when Sheila says something to me, I listen to her. When Karen Rose says something to me, I listen when Brian does because I know them and they know me when I'm, I'm not going to say something that I don't really feel is right about because I love their writing. I love their work and I want them to succeed. And I know they feel the same way about me. You know, nobody gets so good that they don't make mistakes. Right. That's the truth. And you always want to send your best work in. When I send a book in, I, I don't want my editor to have to really edit it. I want it to be my voice. Can you say that again? <laughs> say that again. That's very important. When you send your book into your own publisher, you've written over 90 books, you know, dozens on the bestseller list, over, you know, almost 20 number ones. You still don't send them your first crappy draft. You still bust your butt. So when you send it to them, it's what? 90% you feel like 90% done. Oh, I want it to be 100% done. Unfortunately, what happens, and it does happen, and people don't really understand this too, in formatting, it can get messed up. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people realize this, but it's true. Right. <laughs> and it comes back to me and I'm like, oh, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> How come Gregory's name was changed to Oregon? <laughs> 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 oh, that's funny. Yeah, but and, no, yeah, it, you'd always send your best work to your editor. You never, never. Uh, you, I mean, poor Cheryl. She, she edits and edits and edits. I've never seen someone who wants to send a cleaner manuscript in. A, a, that you just do that. You want to send your best work in. Mm -hmm. You don't want someone else's voice in your in your manuscript and, and also the less easy mistakes your editor has to fix so the less sloppy writing they have to fix the more time they can focus on the meat of your story and catch plot holes or things that aren't that that can make your story stronger and that's really what I want the editor for. I want my writing to be clean, mm -hmm. but I want an editor to help me make my story stronger. And they can't do that if they're cleaning the crap off of my pages, right? They, you, you, you don't want them vacuuming the floor. You want them designing the interior, right? Or, or, or saying your interior design's a little off here. You want them to be able to focus on the big stuff, not the small stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I will just say on critique partners, um, oh, number one, you want people who are gonna give you honest feedback. Um, you want people who have different strengths than you. I have a strength in um, the flow of words. To me, it's, it's like a symphony. So it, I hear it when the words are off and I can, help people this isn't the right word this this is a better word or tighten the sentence up i can i can do that's one of my strengths i think that i bring as a critique partner um but other people's strengths are this fight doesn't make sense 
you know, I, I know more about fighting than you do, or I know more about history than you do, and how about thinking this way? So when you are looking at critique groups, and I encourage other lots of people, but in finding the right one, when you find it, hold on to it, because finding the right meld of talent and, and people that work well together and make each other's books good, that's golden. And we've been together for 20 years now, so. Yeah. And where, so for brand new authors also, and you know, we're talking beta readers, how, how should they go and approach? I mean, how did you guys get your beta readers? Because you're asking people to basically read your stuff and you know help you through it but how did you find beta readers should you have more than five or is three enough what number would you say is a good number and how should someone maybe go approach somebody to say hey i'm writing a novel can you read it for me and should they be your friend or should they be somebody who will sit there and tell you this book sucks instead of your mom saying wow honey you sound great singing you should try out for american idol when you really do suck and you shouldn't sing so Sheila, I'll ask you, what do you think? What do you think about that? You know, uh, for, my, for myself with beta readers, uh, I have a street team and- What is a street I work team? A, you just so, find them uh, on the street? <laughs> I do not find them on the street. My street team, they're called the Story Sleuths. Okay. And, I have, and they're, I've got about 50 people in my group. It's a Facebook group. Okay. And uh, a lot of them I've met at, at uh, conventions or they follow me and they read me. And um, your, your street team will help guy to get the word out. So you tell them, you know, my book is coming out and you don't want to go and tell everybody, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book on social media because then nobody wants to follow you. Um, but other people, you know, will go and say, oh, you know, I love this author and, and they'll do, they'll do other things. So they're kind of your helpers. They want to help. They're your cheerleaders. You know, you have a street team that just, you know, it's like, oh, I'm, you know, I hit the spot and I just, I don't know what to do. And, and they encourage you and that's wonderful. So you start to get to know people a little bit and, uh, you know, you've met them. You, you definitely want someone you trust. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, it's a scary thing. You've got to be very careful who you give your, your manuscript over to. You know, there are people who have had some really horrible experiences with that. So should it be somebody that you don't know? I would say no to that. That's my own personal opinion. For me, I have five people who, are, who beta read, who I've known for a long time. I've given them little pieces of things. I, you know, uh, as you know, I, I do some short stories. So I'll give them a short story. I see they can be trusted with that. So then I'll give them a book or maybe they'll, they'll look over my comic. And, and so you build that trust and then you go ahead. And I, I do have my beta readers sign an NDA. So a non-disclosure. Oh, so now that, that's interesting. I've never heard that before. Okay. That's yeah, so they can't. Know. Yeah, they can't talk about any aspect of the book. And most people respect that. They understand that you're giving them your baby. And, you know, if you're going to give them your baby, you're going to, you're going to, you know, expect yeah. them to, you know, to protect that. And the NDA just kind of helps, you know, and it also helps establish that, you know, that they, that they are participating in something that, um, you know, that has some expectations to it. Mm -hmm. And, and you just appreciate it. You know, you really appreciate that. So yeah, I do have them do an, an NDA. It has to be somebody that you can trust um, or things can go kind of awry, but, um, but that's my own opinion. And, and Christine, you probably have a lot of authors, young authors coming to you saying, will you blurb my book? Will you read it and blurb my book? And of course, you know, you write so much, you probably don't have a lot of time during the day to be able to do those things. So when someone asks you that, how do you kind of answer them back? And, but what can a young author do to maybe get someone like yourself to read and, and blurb their book? Normally all of those go through my uh, agent. Mm -hmm. They, or my editor, they don't, nobody approaches me themselves. I, those don't 
normally get to me. So not even like off your website or if they saw you in like a conference and, uh, and they're it's like, very, oh, you know. very rare okay. for that. And I, I used to have more time. I don't anymore. I, I write six books a year. You see your wrist. Uh, yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I am swamped at right. the moment with uh, so much uh, social media, particularly I've written uh, the murder book mm -hmm. and uh, they have me doing a lot of, um, you know, social media for that. And I just, I've never been, <laughs> I've never been so busy in my life. I sometimes feel like I can't turn around anymore. Oh. But um, so my writing, my reading time has been cut down so much mm -hmm. that uh, it, it's been crazy. And normally uh, I really enjoyed doing that because I like to find new authors. Right. But I haven't, I haven't had the time to read. Uh, anybody new for for quite a while actually but um, normally it's all done through uh, their agent usually sends it to my agent or to my editor that's how that's done so they would have to like research that and sit there and say hey if they want to try to get a hold of you or contact you it's going that route they just can't yeah they just can't tweet to you and be like, Christy, can you read my book? It would you never get to me. Never it get would there. never get to me. No. <laughs> yeah. Cheryl, now, what about just, you? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Like, ahead. I just wanted, yeah, I just wanted to say one quick thing before you move on. Um, Christine's using kind of our lingo because she called it the murder book, um, <laughs> which we call it our <laughs> just amongst ourselves. It's uh -huh. murder at Sunrise Lake. Right. <laughs> Which will be out on Tuesday. <laughs> I just wanted book. to say that because I was just cracking up when she said that. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to say No, that's that. good. That's good. <laughs> so Cheryl, um, what would you what would your advice be for someone who's well, looking to get to you to blurb their book? I actually uh, my critique partners are and friends and family <laughs> right now are my beta readers. I'm actually I don't have 50 people or a bunch that I give my books to. Um, but I will say that um, I have one that the next book I finish, I'm going to send to her. And she's actually a reader who came up to me with written questions. And every time I've seen her, she comes to me with written questions about my books. And I'm like, she, and she's asked me stuff and I'm like, huh, I, I, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. So it was challenging questions too. Things mm -hmm. I hadn't seen in my own book. So I was like, next time I complete a book, I will be sending it to you. And I want you to do that for me for my next book. So I will say, um, you, I love the NDA idea. You really have to trust. Yes, your I, I love that. I never thought of that. It's probably extremely wise. I mean, it's you're, whether you want to admit it or not, if you're writing for publication, it's a business and you've got to protect you your again? intellectual property. It's not a hobby, it's a business. Yes. 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 So that's, you know, protecting your assets is important, mm -hmm. right? So anyways, but it, you want people like, just like critique partners and, and sometimes you'll be looking for people who won't do that extensive stuff but just to say this book really resonated with me or i really didn't care for this character because of blah 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 but now you're getting into opinions are like we know the proverb everybody's got one right. um and for me because <laughs> because the way my brain works i don't want a lot of uh, i i i i don't want a lot of people um giving me negative feedback so if they give me negative feedback, they have to give me positive feedback to cancel out the negative feedback or they don't get my book again. <laughs> okay, gotcha. So it has to be helpful. I mean, you want it to be truthful and not everybody's going to like every book you write. Um, so you True. find people who are going to like that kind of stuff because otherwise what's the point of having them be your beta reader? Right. I tell people to look at things in your real life and say, don't ask people to do things like, you wouldn't do so if you're trying to say hey go out there and buy my book or do whatever but you're not but that's something that you wouldn't really do then don't tell people 
to go do it because they're not going to. And like you said, not everybody might like everything. I mean, I'm sure all of you have bands that you listen to. You might not like every album they ever did or every song they ever produced. That's okay. But you trust them to know that what they're giving you is their best. Yeah. And, you know, you look at it that way. And so that's why I always tell people, I'm like, hey, again, you don't like everything that if your favorite band is Bon Jovi, you don't maybe like everything Bon Jovi's ever done, but you like a lot of it and enough of it to where you still love that band. Right. And I think that that's always important for people to remember, use your own way that you do your daily life and, and look at it that way, because don't expect someone else to do something that you won't do or think some way that you don't think. I, I, do, I never understood that and never got and, that. And, and we all will go and tell people when we've read a really good book and we, because we are readers first. Mm -hmm. So we will all go and say, oh my gosh, guys, you got to go check this book out. It's phenomenal. And, and it is, and I don't, none of us ever feel like praising or promoting some the book of an author either we know or don't know perfect stranger does anything uh, it, it, you know it doesn't hurt us to do it some people are like oh you should only that's the most silly thing um, I've ever heard which is you have to say bad things about your competition to rise your own boat I'm like no no rising tides raise all boats and if it's a really good book tell your readers it's a really good book you cannot you cannot write fast even christine cannot write <laughs> fast enough to no, and and writers should raise up other writers i mean that's the whole point of it I, you you need the to readers, help each other yeah. exactly yeah. you cannot write I, honestly you cannot write enough books to satisfy all readers it's just not going to happen no no and what about reviews? There's always a lot of thing about reviews. And I saw Cheryl just kind of laugh at that one. So, yeah. but I, so let me start with you real quick, Sheila. Do you read your reviews? And if you do, how do you kind of process them? And I will say the reason I ask is because there's a good friend of mine, Kevin O'Brien, who's a writer. You might know him. He writes kind of in the horror suspense genre, but he reads his reviews. And he says the one that is the worst, like the one that he hates the most, he kills that person in the next book. That's like his way of cleansing himself. <laughs> he needs to meet Karen. So he'll kill yeah. that person in the next book. So I'm wondering, Sheila, so I'll start with you again. Do you read reviews? What would you tell a new author that put out a debut book? Should they even look at them? Should they just not ignore them? What, 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 what advice do you give? Oh, first of all, I'm totally going to steal that. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to start. Yeah. Uh, you know, when they're professionally reviewed, like uh, literary, I got the literary Titan um, award for one of my books and they did, gave it a five-star review. And I went and I read that. And um, sometimes that, that that's great. You see what other people think you, the strong suit of your story is. And that might be helpful <laughs> to know that, or that might feel good to know that. Um, but to go over to read, uh, reviews on book sites, I think that it's a double-edged sword and you have to be careful for as much as it might build your, your ego to see those five stars. When you see that one star, or you see that two stars, um, it can be cutting and, and you tell yourself, okay, I tell myself, I realize everybody has an opinion. I realize my stuff is not for everybody. It's not everybody's cup of tea. And I realized there are a lot of jerks in the world who will just come and say, I didn't read this, but this looks stupid. You know, um, I think that people have every right to say how they feel about a book. If you're not reading the book and you're reviewing it. Well, okay, yeah, that's, that's a really big fair. problem too. It is a big problem. Those reviews. I, yes. But for people, you know, some books don't work for some people. It just doesn't. They have every right to say it. I, I appreciate they've taken the time, whether they liked it or they didn't like it, because it's hard to get any reviews or any feedback like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I would just tell people, be careful about going to read those reviews because, you know, it, you don't know what you're going to get. So you're taking a chance. It's a gamble. It's a gamble to, to, to see that. I do ask my street team to write reviews. You know, it's good to have reviews. 
And, uh, but you want people to be honest too. Right. So, you know, reviews are, I think they're good to have when you're a new author because some people do really care about the reviews. Um, but, you know, I don't know. It's just hard. I like what you said about getting reviews because they are hard because we get about 10,000 yes. books a year sent to us for the magazine to review. We mm -hmm. can't review 10,000 books. It's just not going to happen. I mean, it's just a lot. So it is. And people ask me, well, how can I get reviewed by you? And I'm like, you can send it in. I can't guarantee anything. I'll try to get it to somebody, but it's just, I, I can't, I can't guarantee. And I, and I feel bad because I would love to review everything. So, but I just can't, you know. Okay, Cheryl. I know you laughed about the reviews. I want to hear what you had to say about the reviews. You must have some funny stories, something going oh, on here. No, I have a brain that that forgets all sorts of things, but it never forgets the bad stuff. <laughs> and 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 that's that's I've discovered that's dangerous for me. Um, uh, I I get honest critiques. I love that. Um, I it's it's because I always want to write a book that people are going to love. It's a very hard. And, and I can honestly say I really wasn't prepared um, when my books were first published and they immediately took off. I wasn't prepared. And I think my skin has gotten a little thicker over the years, but I've also learned that I took, I don't, I don't look for reviews and I don't go out and read the review. Some people will send me them, but I say, don't, don't send me really bad ones because I won't be able to forget them. Send me, you know, the ones that make me feel like I'm doing a good job and want to keep writing. Um, I'm amazed at now, authors will, that will engage bad review people back. I'm oh like, no. why are you trying oh, to incite the crazy no. people? No. Now I, I will say as a reader, I read reviews of other people. And on occasion when I and when I'm feeling masochistic and I go to read bad reviews of my books and um, the thing that I do to get it out of my brain is I'll go find a book that I think is perfect, that I adore. And I will go read the one-star reviews. And then I will say, I think this is the most amazing book ever. How can this Cretan think this is right. not the most amazing book ever? And then I realized, it wasn't for him. So that helps put things in perspective. But for my own mental health, I don't tend to read reviews of my own work unless um, <laughs> unless somebody um, juries them and sends me the, the ones that make me feel good <laughs> instead of the ones that make me want to slip my throat. <laughs> oh, man. Christine, what about you? You've had a lot of books. So you've had a lot of reviews. <laughs> You, you have to remember that, uh, you know, I'm a lot older. And so during when it. Yeah, you're way pre Amazon being able to have well, all this and everything. When they up. first were coming out, people could put up anything. It was before uh, they even tried to make sure that there were purchases. So people could go, they could attack you in you know, other authors could get together or their fans could attack you. And I didn't know that. And so it was extremely hurtful and painful. And I didn't understand what was going, going on for a long time. And um, that, that was, it was pretty horrible. And at the very beginning of my career, I had almost ended my career because I, Whoa. I could barely, uh, you know, function after reading some of the horrible things that were said oh. in these, uh, you know, the reviews and the chat rooms and the, you know, I just the, there were message boards and yeah. things yeah. like that. And the then vile stuff that people put out. Yes. And it was very personal against yeah. me and the people didn't even know me. You know? I know. And so it, it was very hurtful. And so I, um, I stopped reading anything. And then I knew other authors who just quit writing because Man. of that very being attacked by groups of, of people. So I, I made it a policy not to read them. 
and and I kept that policy uh, pretty much. Now I I get I get these it it just boggles my mind. I will spend so much like time trying to perfect these books. I research and research and research and and I choose every word and I really think I'm I love my book and feel very great about it and I send it out there and I'm waiting for something and I get this somebody will write to me they write me because I'm not looking at a review they don't say I loved your book I hated your book Mm -hmm. I'll say you had a typo on page 398 (laughs) (laughs) and that's all they say they don't say I liked your book they don't say I hated your book I mean Come on, people, mm-hmm. give me something. Something. <laughs> R.L. Stein, I, I talked with R.L. <laughs> Stein once and he said, he said the greatest email he ever got was from a reviewer and it was from a, it was from a kid and I forget how old he was. And the email simply said, I've read all of your books and I hate them all. <laughs> and he's like, well, at least you read them all. <laughs> oh, I had one lady. Who oh, my favorite me. one. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And she would say, I read dark prints and then she would give me a a quote from it uh you know i hate this book i wish you'd die so i don't have to read another one and then she would she would quote the next book and tell me she wished i would die so she didn't have to read another one and she kept doing this and finally i wrote to her and i said honey don't buy the next book you don't have to read it I don't have to die. You don't have to read the book. You should have said, I got two friends, Cheryl and Sheila, who write books. Go bug them. (laughs) (laughs) Go read their books and bug them and leave me alone. (laughs) Pass the buck forward. Oh, my gosh. I mean, and that's the thing. And, And I'm sure now the one thing that a lot of authors focus on, too, is they all love signings and they and they make it like it's the end all be all kind of where they go, hey, I need to have my book in print. I need to want, I need to sign it. I have to go to, you know, bookstores and sign things. And I am kind of under the thing like that's a little old school and it's not to worry about that. And so the marketing aspect of course is, and this is like myth busters, the biggest myth that I always bust out with these authors are look, just because someone's publishing you, whether it's suspense publishing or book or Berkeley or Penguin or Random House, whoever, you still have to be the sole marketer of your books. Don't expect your publisher to be the sole marketer and to make you into a bestseller or whatnot. It's not going to happen. So Sheila, I'll go back to you first on this one. When it comes to marketing, when you tell a new author, I always say it's 90% you, 10% the publisher, as far as the marketing goes, because as a publisher, you know, we have seven books that we're doing in a time frame. We can't spend everything on one. We have to divvy out to seven because there's only one of us. So talk a little bit about marketing to a new author when they, like I said, as like a myth buster thinking just because you're signed with a publisher doesn't mean you don't have to stop talking about your book and marketing it. Just like what you're doing now. Right, right. Uh, I think that I I would agree that it's 90% you and 10% the publisher that might, that might change for some, for some authors, but a new author, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I find that it's my experience that, um, a publisher will look at your social media platform even before they consider picking you up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I work in the industry, as I've said before, and I, I, I was told by someone that, um, that works for one of the big publishers that they sometimes have what they call a cat fight. Mm -hmm. So let's say you've got five editors and they are all looking to pick up three books and they're going to bring that to the table and they're going to try and decide which ones are the are the best well let's say that it comes down to you and one other person and you have very similar books and they're both amazing books your book could be totally amazing it made it to this final round and there's somebody else who has something similar what do you think they're going to look at they're going to look at who's the best bet they are. This is a business. So if the other person is maybe an expert in that field and you're not, Uh well, that's an issue, but you have 5,000 followers on Facebook and they have no Facebook. 
And the publisher is going to look at what do you bring to the table? Because this is a partnership. This is because it's a business. It's a business. Yes. And so this is a partnership with your with your publisher. This isn't your publisher works for you. You know, this this is something that that you're you're going to have to invest in and they expect you to invest in it. Mm -hmm. So marketing is extremely important. Social media is extremely important. When you're doing your social media, you're building your brand. You're letting people know who you are and what mm -hmm. they can expect from you. And that's going to be important in the long haul. Your book finally comes out. Does that mean that you have to stop? <laughs> no. <laughs> now you're doubling your efforts because now you have something to talk about. Mm -hmm. and, and you hope that, you know, you can get other people interested. You don't want to put buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. And that's all that's on your social media. People want to know who you are. And I'll tell you straight up, there are people, there are authors that I've met that I would not read their book because it's not my cup of tea but I love them. I love that author. I met them. They were wonderful. And I buy their book, whether I read it or not. That is the power of social media. That is the power of marketing. That is the power of people being with people and people getting to know you. So I think, you know, definitely you, you have to put yourself out there. It's, it's, you know, word of mouth. And sometimes that's done electronically. So, uh, so definitely social media and marketing, you know, you have to budget your time mm -hmm. in order to invest in that. Um, definitely, there's no sense in doing anything if you don't have a book or if you don't have a good book, you know, a good book helps sell itself, but you still have to have to put an effort in, into that. Cheryl, your turn. Um, well, I'm not a huge social media. I, 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 for social media, you have to do what's comfortable for you. Right. I am not, I am not on Twitter. Um, I am on Twitter, but I don't tweet a lot um, except to say, you know, what are you reading? Recommend new books or uh, what? Here's a blog I wrote, whatever. Um, I prefer Facebook because I feel like I can actually have conversations where I can follow everything in the post the block. Yeah. <laughs> so it's an easier format for me. And I, and I enjoy that format a little bit better. So um, I think whatever you do, you actually have to enjoy doing um, for me, the, on the marketing aspect, um, I like going to sci-fi fantasy conventions and I, those fans are rapid, aren't they? They are. They're wonderful. Sci-fi fantasy and erotica romance fans will follow you to the ends of the earth and they will walk off the cliff with you reading the book as they're falling, hoping they get to the end before they hit the ground. They, because you are the provider of their yes. drug of choice and yes, they, you are their addiction. You are their drug yes, dealer. That's a good way of putting absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, something that I found very useful and it always surprises me that more people don't do it. Handing out pens does not tell people I'm a good writer. <laughs> just tells people you have good penmanship. Right, oh, right. Okay. Or, or hey, I, I, I spent, hey, this is a good pen. The ink <laughs> last, right? What I found really works for me is I would print up booklets of the first, up to the first really good hook in the book and print them out. And I would give that out because people look at bookmarks and throw away. But if you give them a little booklet that's an excerpt of your book meant to suck them in, and I will tell you, I have handed out many of those at a convention and many a person has come back and bought my whole series um, because they That's a very good idea. I never thought of that either. Because I'm a writer. What do I have to sell? My words. So right. let me give you a sample of my words. And if it sucks you in, you know where I am. Come back yeah. and buy my book. Awesome. And, and that was a, and the other thing that I do is, um, especially because I write series, um, I tend to always keep on hand uh, my first book and I oh, okay. am perfectly fine with handing out free copies of my first book to people who are interested because if they like the first one they will go get the other ones so again it's me what I've got to sell are, is my writing it's my words so do my words appeal to you there's more you can get and um one thing that Christine and I talked about early in the early days before I was published and her career was really ramping up 
was everything should direct your readers to sign up on your mailing list. So you have your own um, people who are your rabid fans who want to know what you're writing next and when they can get their hands on it. And, and then that's another kind of marketing that you can do. Send out a newsletter or, or just a, hey, I've got a book coming out. Here's when it's coming out. Here's your pre-order link. Here's an excerpt. And those are the kind of things that I like to do. And I like to talk to people too. So I do engage and send cute kitty pictures and talk about, you know, just, just be my friend, you know? Just so, be my friend. Right? <laughs> be my friend. <laughs> what about you, Christine? Well, um, very early on, I um, started a community for my um, readers where I could engage with them in, at my website. Um, so I wanted to protect them from, you know, spammers. So they had to sign up to go inside. It was, of course, free, but then spammers couldn't get to them. Right. And I started thinking, okay, well, I'll never get 10,000 people. So, but that was kind of how much we thought would, you know, that was all we thought would really get in there. And so that was sort of the ceiling that we had. And I now have like 167,000 people. We had to keep changing the amount of, you know, that we expanded the salary cap. Yeah. And so I have walls that people can go in and they can, um, I don't go on those where they can discuss the books and I don't go on those because I want them to be able to discuss them without feeling like they're going to hurt my feelings, but I have my own where they can come and just ask me any question they want to ask, and then I can answer it. And um, so that's, that's been really great um, having that on my website. Um, so that's one way that I started out and it started out really, really small and it just sort of built. Um, and then I have Facebook. Um, which is, and I just use that for, <clears throat> I do Facebook live and, and I do con, you know, where I get, I do giveaways when a book comes out and I do Instagram. I don't do Twitter. Um, it's just a lot. There's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. lot. <laughs> It's a lot. a lot. And I'm not as tech savvy as people think I am. I'm not. <laughs> Just, I wish I was, but I'm not. Um, but I, as far as marketing goes, you do have to market. I, I mean, I have to market. Yeah. I have to do a lot of the marketing. Um, I have fortunately uh, built up my own team, my own marketing team that works for me. And um, I have, um, you know, like three people um, that really works on my marketing when a book comes out mm -hmm. and uh, that works for me. And then, um, you know, the, I, the now, the only recently, uh, the publishing house does ads for me, but it's not been that long that they've done it. Yeah. So you have you have to do you have to do your own marketing. Every you, you just do. Yeah. So speaking of marketing, let's do some self promotion for yourself. So yeah. we'll start. So we'll just start with Christine here. And just keep it going. Oh. So what are you writing oh. right now? I'm, oh, you're reaching for the books. I am. Right, it's time to reach for the books, Look at this. everybody. There this it is. is coming out on the 29th, right, Sheila? That's <laughs> did right. I that right? <laughs> you did. <laughs> so, so um, this is this will be coming out on the 29th of this month. I'm very excited about it. And uh, it's Murder at Sunrise Lake. And um, it takes place. From, it's a little different from your normal stuff, right? Yes, it's a it's a uh murder it's a it's a murder book it's yeah. a suspense <laughs> a, it's, a, it's a suspense it's a kind of a mystery and it takes place in the eastern sierras 
okay. uh, you know, it's, it was fun to write and, um, you know, a lot of yeah. dead bodies dropping <laughs> around the place. <laughs> and so, and that book comes out June 29th. Uh-huh. And then yes. I'm sure you have one coming out in September and one in October. Or uh, November, in Dark November. Tarot comes out, which okay. is a dark book. And that was a that's going to be a really interesting book for uh, my dark readers. Uh, it it will revisit some of the older couples and which they love, mm -hmm. but it's very different. And um, I think they're going to be a little okay. surprised nice. and shocked. <laughs> nice that'll be fun and then i have uh, right after that will be um two torpedo ink books right in a row oh, one wow. i believe in december is that correct sheila and yeah, then one december. in january oh. they follow each other and they're both standalones okay but they're the same couple wow and mm -hmm. that's why we have that on the wrist I yes, understand. that's a lot of writing, <laughs> and you're probably writing today. I'm sure there's probably. I some am. I'm writing a. Uh, I'm writing a game book, a phantom game. Okay. So yes, nice. I'm, I'm doing that. So. Cheryl, what you got going on? Well, um, I uh, don't have any books out this year. I am working on the third of my Weather Mages of Mistral series. This was the first, um, the Winter King. Thank nice. you, Sheila. I'm at Christine's house. I didn't know this was coming or I have had other show and tells, but here's my show and tell. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I have got about uh, four other books in progress. So three set in my fading lands, um, my original uh, epic fantasy world. And um, I get two mistral books and um, and super secret project that we spent yesterday brainstorming with Ooh, secret yes. pro don't worry no one's no one's watching it's just a four of us what's going on i'm actually gonna try my hand at writing with a co-writer with a with a partner nice so very cool I'm super excited she's one of my friends for you know we've been friends for years and we both love the same things and are really having a really good time. So we want something that's paranormal and romancy. And I insisted that we be able to laugh in the book as well. So crazy characters and, and some humor, lots of humor, I hope. So with a house nice. full of witches. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila, what you got? Yes. So uh, right now, um, I have a book out with my agent who's shopping it, Mary Shelley's League of Supernatural Hunters. And um, so fingers crossed for that. It's a full novel. But out this year is going to be part two. It's called Demon's Gate, but it's um, the second to this. It follows up Fear Fest. It's a comic oh, book. Nice. Adam Frankenstein. Yeah. So very excited to have another Frankenstein comic book come out. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yeah, hope I'm hoping to have that done by the time Dragon Con rolls around. Cheryl and I are both going to be at Dragon Con this year. And where is that? Atlanta, every Atlanta. Labor Day weekend. Okay. It takes I've... over the whole city of Atlanta. It so it's does. always it's Atlanta huge. and it's always Labor always. Day. Okay. Always Labor yes. Day weekend, always Atlanta. And nice. it takes up five, five con five hotels. hotels. Wow. Yes. Yeah, it's Jeez. huge. Science fiction people are crazy. Fantasy people are nuts. I'm oh, one of them though, because <laughs> horror and horror and, and fantasy are my two biggest genres, along with mystery. I love those are my three favorite, my three favorite I love genres. All of it. I, I'm I, not a gore fan. I like no. horror, which is why I always say 1978 Halloween is my favorite horror movie of all time. Because if you look, there's no blood in that movie because he had no he had no um, uh, budget for it. He didn't have budget for blood. <laughs> so the only blood you see is a very little splatter on the girl who's laying on the bed that he has um, the uh, uh, the Myers, uh, Judith Myers, uh, her head's her gravestone. That's about the only blood that you saw, which is the other thing about that movie is when you see the leaves blowing across the street, this was all filmed in Pasadena. And you guys, this is suspension of disbelief. There's palm trees in the movie, all right? <laughs> in Illinois <laughs> and so and all the trees are green with leaves but it's fall and you see these leaves blowing across the road 
Yeah, that was done by a fan, and then they had to go pick them all up and put them in bags so they could do it again because he had no budget for that stuff. <laughs> so that's just one of those funny little things, that another suspension of disbelief. But now when you it. watch Halloween, you look, and the opening scenes when you see Lori walking and you know going Jamie Lee Curtis, you'll see three palm trees. Oh, that's too funny. You will see three palm trees in front of people's homes, and you'll be like, how in the hell is this Illinois? But you never realized it when you watched the movie that they were there. <laughs> You just glossed it all over. So yeah, that, that's because you like the characters. <laughs> <laughs> I like the characters, and I cannot wait for the new Halloween movie to come out. And I will be in the theater opening weekend watching that with my mask on, of course. But I'm watching that movie because I've seen them all in the theater, and I'm not missing that one. I just it's my favorite series, so I watch that one. But yeah, what a hoot! That's yeah. so cool. And you know, and I'm. Um, and so your websites, let's, 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 so throw out your website so people know the best place to find everything out about you too. So Christine. Uh, I'm christinebian.com. And that's your good portal for everything. I know because your yes. website is very, yeah. And Cheryl? clwilson.com. And it, I bet you, I'm going to guess, sheilaenglish.com. Oh, how did you ever guess? We like to keep it simple. Sheilaenglish.com. Yeah, I'm you good. Are. I'm good. I try to do my best. <laughs> and I'm waiting for my, you know, if you want to submit your book to Suspense Publishing, we're waiting for it, guys. Whenever you want to write something, if someone says, I don't really know. Come you your just, way. You just All right. Way. So, <laughs> is there anything else that you guys want to mention that you guys want to touch on that we have not talked about before we kind of wrap this up? I'll leave it to you. Keep reading. Yes. <laughs> yes. Try new books. Yes. <laughs> And, and all of uh, you writers out there, send your best version to the editor. Yes. And you can't be a writer if you're not a reader. You have to read. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Read a book. Yeah, you have to read. You just can't, you know, it's a, you can't build a bridge if you didn't study to build a bridge. So it's the same thing. Writing, reading and writing definitely go hand in hand. They do. So, yeah. Well, guys, this has been phenomenal. And I'm so happy. I'm so glad that, you know, we put this together and, and hopefully some young writers and, and people get, and writers that are writing today, like find out some new things like NDA and some other things about beta readers and stuff. So um, that's tremendous. And I'm definitely using the excerpt booklet idea too. I'm going to tell our authors, guess what we're going to start doing. So the best. Yeah. yeah, those little things like that. So guys, I want to thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to speak with you guys and have you guys all on Zoom to, to talk about this. You guys have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. See you, John. All right.